let's kick into this. So first and foremost, my name is David Wolstenholme. I'm the founder of Brand Me Better, and I'm your host on today's webinar, uh, Moving You to Retain. And I'm joined by the lovely Louise Archer, um, who is the founder of Retrained, uh, and her name and brand is making waves, not just in the UK, but globally. Uh, and my mission is to share and find great people who can add benefits to the lives of recruiters. I think we're both on similar missions. Now, a good friend of mine and a client, Ez Khan from Spencer Lane, um, has suggested to me when you, you, you host your first webinar, which I'm doing today, um, is to have a glass of gin. Uh, if it's an afternoon one, but I'm, I'm actually going for a glass of cold water. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't got a gin. I'm um, at six <laughs> in the morning. I, I think that's a good job. <laughs> that would be concerning if you were drinking gin at 6 a.m. Yeah. Okay, so before we jump in, and I'm, Louise can do a bit of an introduction, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. There ain't much housekeeping. Uh, I'm not going to bore you. So the webinar has been recorded. You're all going to get access to it after it's finished. Um, share it with your friends and colleagues if you think they would get some value from it. The only people today you're going to hear speaking is myself and Louise. Um, there's not going to be any slides, it's not going to be death by PowerPoint, just two people from up north having a conversation. It's something that I haven't got expertise on and Louise has as well. So we're going to go for about 45 minutes um, and then we're going to fire 15 minutes of questions. I ask you to make them as difficult as possible so you can wake <laughs> up. Brilliant, um, thanks. So first and foremost, Louise, let's not keep it boring. I want three things from you. I want a little bit of uh, your background, so who you are, where you're from, why you do what you do. And the third one, which is a bit of a weird one, just to keep it lighthearted, is if this was your last ever three course meal today, what would you eat? Okay. Um, I'm Louise Archer. I'm from Manchester in uh, northwest England. I've been in recruitment pretty much my whole career, about 20 years. Um, my mum ran a recruitment agency, in fact, so I was filing CVs at nine years old in the summer holidays, and back in those days when there was no internet. Um, and my brother's also in recruitment as well, so I guess it's, a, it's become a family thing. Wow. Um, I um, Who am I? Where am I from? And why do I do what I do? I do what I do because about eight years ago, I transitioned to retain from contingent for many, many, many years. And I had no idea it was even possible. Um, and it was, as it turned out. And not only was it possible, but it literally changed my life and changed everything and I fell back in love with recruitment again and so the reason I teach contingent recruiters how to transition to retained or build retained search capability is because I love giving them the same opportunity that I had um, and then what would I eat so um, three courses I love Italian food it's it's the most fattening combination isn't it <laughs> but spaghetti carbonara I just love I absolutely love it so I'd, it'd have to be something really fattening and unhealthy um like that I guess some kind of seafood to start with I love fish and seafood um and chocolate every time for dessert always chocolate like a proper rich chocolate ganache or something <laughs> like that <laughs> now we better not talk about this anymore because a lot of our listeners are, are from australia it's almost dinner time here so they're going to be leaving the webinar <laughs> right so um excellent um and today the the invite that i sent, sent out and uh, people in my network sent out was to cover um seven topics or conversations um and um, what I would love you to do is just go into a bit more detail. We'll kick off with the first one as well. I, I've had a look at some of the people that are here. And hello to everyone. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And there seems to be, from what I've seen, a mixed bunch of experience. So there's people that are very, very experienced that uh, I suspect may already sell retained um, search. Um, mm -hmm. And there's people who are very new to recruitment who have probably heard that word as well. So what I'd love you to do, uh, and it is your hot topic, is just explain to people in, in, in simple terms what retained recruitment is and isn't and what makes it different from contingency. Yeah, it's a really good question because um, 
Hi everyone, I haven't properly said hello to everybody, so hello. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and thank you so much David for having me. Pleasure. Um, I, yeah, it's a really good question because what, what I find with contingent recruiters particularly and those that have had maybe some luck in securing rec retained work but aren't doing it consistently is that part of the reason that they're not or not able to do that if it's something that they want to do um, is, is because they don't really have a full understanding of exactly what retained you know retained recruitment or retained search is and therefore it makes it so difficult when um, when, they, when they're selling it to a client because articulating what it is and the difference becomes quite hard and quite challenging. So I find that uh, lots of recruiters, me included, um, years ago, um, think that it's money up front. Um, you know, if, if you ask them to explain it or define it, it's money up front or it's headhunting or it's, um, it's serve or executive or senior positions. Um, and so that's, it's one of the sort of myths or um, that I like to, you know, that, that we like to start with as well, because for me and in all the success that, that I had um, and, and now do teaching other people, um, if we look at it as a um, you know, it, it, contingent, if we start with contingent just for a second, if contingent recruitment is the definition of contingent is by chance, right? Um, and therefore inversely retain search is financial commitment from a client which allows us to apply a robust process whatever that might be um, whatever's necessary um, to ensure that we guarantee to fill the position and that we work with the, with the client until the position is filled or uh, and not just with any candidate but with the best that to them in the market at this time um, or as a, a worst case scenario give them all of the intelligence on that um, talent pool to be able to make the next best decision either changing internal structures or um, uh, changing the, the scope of the of the role um, so yeah for me that's the definition is that financial commitment from the client which allows us to put in place and carry out a robust process mitigating against any of the that could possibly go wrong to ensure that we guarantee a result. How well do you think hiring managers understand it? They've never um, bought that kind of solution before. That's such a good question. I just, um, I, I'd largely, I don't think they do. And a huge part of the sales process, not of, um, as you know, because we, you know, we've been getting to know each other. I'm not a salesy, hard sell type of person. Um, a, a huge amount of it is education and explanation of why it's necessary to secure the financial commitment, which yeah. enables us to be able to do our job properly mentally. So I don't think they do. Many, many of them don't. Yeah. Okay. And do you think it? When you become a retained recruiter, you, you get better at actually asking deeper questions to get into the problems of their, their um, business and recruitment solutions they might be looking for them might not know what it is. A hundred percent. I think for several reasons. Um, one of the main ones being that you don't want to take something on that isn't, 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 is, is going to be impossible <laughs> you know there's several circumstances that i you know i advise not to take on um, a retained project and one of those is if it's if the uh, if the position is really difficult or, or rather impossible to fill um and if you've got a client that is difficult to deal with or unpleasant you know i'd also say don't take it on so one of the reasons that you're um as a retainer recruiter you're questioning so thoroughly at the front end of the project even before you you know you're pitching for it is to get a really good understanding of what it is that they're looking for and is that realistic and is it achievable and it are all of the stakeholders involved in the process um aligned with what it is that they're looking for is there a common goal and a common understanding is everybody going to cooperate in the process and etc cetera, etc cetera. and all those all those questions that you ask is to make sure that you can mitigate against all those things that could go wrong and enable that you can you know enable these to guarantee a result so that is that yeah you definitely do get do you much think better at ask questions? enough questions do you think they ask enough big big questions to to kind of get to that point and get that information? 
Recruiters in general, did you say, Doug? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, what I find, which is really common, I find with um, recruiters that, that I work with, working on a contingent basis, ask a certain number up to a certain point and then stop and then they pitch. So um, about them, about the client, they'll ask about the company, they'll ask about yeah. the plans, they'll ask about you know what what the needs are they'll they'll get into the details of those needs and those that requirement they're looking for and they'll unpick the technical spec or the job spec and then talk about salary and career and, and and all that and then they'll they'll take the job on and they'll say okay i'll take that away and i'll go and i'll send some cvs in person and you know they'll do a sell then i guess one of the, the key things that there is on a contingent basis what you're actually selling at that point is i i'm gonna i do send you some cvs for free so it's not a it's not the same as when you know obviously when you're selling a retained solution the sales process um, but, but but what what happens is yeah they stop at, at taking the requirement and what they don't do is ask about talent acquisition they don't ask things like how do you normally go about a piece of recruitment what methods do you normally use? How does it go for you? Do you enjoy it? What kind of challenges do you face? How have you overcome them in the past? What kind of challenges do you expect to face in this kind of process? Think it be easy, difficult? How are you feeling about it? And those are the questions really, you know, a lot of people say to me at the moment, you know, it's very difficult to, well, people with self-limiting beliefs about um, being able to sell retainers mainly, but it's really difficult to sell uh, retain search in this market. You know, there's so many candidates available and so many agencies clambering over, over each other for fees. I say it isn't like that. That 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 is a very reason. That is a reason in itself to choose a, a retain solution because it eliminates all of that noise. If you, if you can uncover the fact that a client is fed up with being bombarded with recruiters or completely inundated with documents or just sick of recruiters in general, which is so often the case at the moment, and um, well, and any time really, unfortunately. Um, but then it's, if you can uncover that in your questioning, which we, contingent recruiters tend to steer away from asking, yeah. we can actually identify the need and the opportunity for a retained solution. Absolutely, excellent. All right, so we're, the, the next topic is around how to sell retain to clients you've been successfully delivering on a continued basis. So well, that's hypothetical theory, situation here. We've got a recruiter, they've been recruited for four years, they're bloody good at what they do, but they've always mm -hmm. sold contingent. And John Smith from Mining Markets is one of their best clients. And they're thinking about providing, you know, asking for a retain search or recommending, shall we say. So I think um, the first way of doing that that springs to mind is um, think about how, how much risk that you, you're putting yourself in, um, exposing yourself to by, um, by working on a contingent basis, especially sometimes with a client that you know very well, because if you have successfully made fees working with them before, then you're likely to invest a significant time, amount of time and effort trying to make sure that you do that again. Yeah. Um, and if you're working on a contingent basis, you're working completely at risk with absolutely no financial commitment at all. And there is nothing to stop that client at any point in the process. I've decided not to recruit this after all, even if it's exclusive, it doesn't matter if it's or whether there's loads of other, I mean, there's even more risk if there's other agencies involved because we race against them and um, you don't have time to qualify candidates properly less than properly so is hugely at risk of those candidates um deciding against it or not actually being right for the job um and not to mention the, the cv that the client oh, i couldn't you know i just couldn't not i hope you understand mate you know just it was i couldn't which happens and i know it happens because it used to happen to me all the time too um you are you are huge uh, at huge risk and um, that's been exacerbated even more recently with you know what's been going on because clients have genuinely had to change their plans and have had to shift um, their emphasis or their focus and uh, with the best will in the world they've been giving advice to recruiters that have been spending significant amount of time and effort on them only to have to say 
I'm really sorry. I know you hope you understand. This has really changed the landscape for us. And that recruiter has then uh, worked for, um, a, you know, you often fair amount of time on yeah. a position that doesn't result in a fee. So we've got the perfect opportunity to say to our clients now, look, um, we've been working together for however many days, um, or weeks or months or whatever, and, I've, and we've done this and we've done this and we've done this. But, um, I want, I love working with you, you know, be honest, be straight and talk about where you'd like the relationship to go. You know, it's a bit like a, you know, a, um, a romance. I think it's good to align on what the long-term goals are, isn't it? I you should know, get my wife in on this meeting. In the future. Well now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so saying to them, look, I really want to continue to, you know, develop our relationship and become a real trusted advisor or trusted partner to you. And um, that, 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 that for me is really important. However, where we find ourselves right now is um, we, we, we want to continue to provide the kind of service that we have been providing um, to you. But when we work on the basis that we are at the moment, we're working, we're working at risk. Um, and it could, it could be that that client has actually put you in that situation and you can refer to that exact situation where not they've let you down, but have been put in a position where it's, it's not commercially viable to spend time and effort because you're, you're at such risk and explaining that to a client maybe you, we don't want to change the model of payment um, in terms of the actual overall fee percentages we're not looking to make more money from you but what we want to do is just secure some financial commitment from you which enables us to put the time and effort that is required to make sure we continue to deliver the level of service that you've been used to and that we continue to deliver um and that would be a way of explaining that your position and the risks that you face working on a contingent basis and now like I say is a good time to uh, review that and reset um, those relationships to give you every possible chance of being able to continue to provide that level of service to them. And in your experience how often do you get the objective back oh come on Bob we've spent 250 grand with you over the last 12 months or do they actually take that on board and, and consider that if you've been delivering the value that you have and you you put your argument not argument but you put your case across of why you don't you want to reduce this risk i think a lot a lot of times it, it works a lot of the times clients understand you know i've done so many of these myself and now i'm supporting consultants that are clients sometimes long-term you know high value clients like you've just mentioned and they do understand and as, as you know as a lot of the response is oh, yeah I wondered when this you know this conversation might they're almost expecting it a little bit um, and they don't disagree they don't um, disagree with and they, I mean it's, com it's it's commercial sense right that we, we're working when you actually explain it to them they often just have, sometimes they just haven't really realized um, so it works well. It does work really, really well, especially if, you know, you can do all sorts of things then to try and, you know, to tip the edge. Let, let me show you that we are, we're not just interested in that engagement fee. Cause I think that's sometimes what clients are worried about. Well, you're just going to take that engagement fee and then, um, not, not perform and money at the front end for your cash flow. Um, and it isn't, it isn't about that. It is about having that security. We don't want to cut our fees by two thirds or by a quarter. That's not our objective here. Yeah, yeah. What we want to do is have some commitment, some security from you, because I know if we have commitment from you, we can do whatever it takes to make sure that we we guarantee a result. And I think when you when you explain that, that helps as well. And sometimes even it might not be that you want to reduce overall, um, you know, the cost to that client. But you're going to make a commitment to you, particularly over a significant period of time. You know, if you've been working for the, with them for a long time, you could trial it over, you know, six months, say. And if you've got that, that security of that guaranteed revenue for 10 positions over that number of time estimated, then maybe you can give the economy a scale and you can offer them, you know, preferential rates for in return for their security yeah yeah so yeah. It, it could even be beneficial for them and i think that's when they really start to think mm, okay I see, not only do i see what you mean but actually this could be too yeah yeah i get it 
So the, 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 I remember, because I'm, I'm a fan of yours, I'm also a fan of Mitch Sullivan. I think you're on similar types of missions. He's evolved a little yeah. bit into copywriting as well. But I remember when I interviewed him for an article and we talked about, um, um, you know, the easiest way to sell retained is to start off just bit by bit and do it with your existing clients. Mm. But I suppose that leads into my next question, uh, or the topic I want to talk about, which is selling to clients that you've never worked with before. Um, mm. How do you do that? Well, I, I didn't know that about Mitch, actually. I didn't know that he, um, um, that he, that he does it with existing clients. I mean, I guess, I suppose we do the same thing, but we do, we do a mixture brand um, existing because when we look back at the um, consultants that win um, projects through the program which is between 50 and 75 percent of, of consultants but anyway, the reason um, we, we look at them and it's about half and half surprisingly uh, those that are winning their first retainers are just as likely to win it with a new client as they are with an existing client oh wow, um, wow that's really interesting. I know I know, that I know. It is me. really surprising. It's really surprising. You know, sometimes like we had one yesterday. It's a massive project. It's like um, 30k on commencement and 60k on completion for two two hires. He's, he's never sold a retainer in his life, and it's a brand new client. They've never worked with them before, and you know, nobody's more surprised than me. I guess him. Um, but um, but it is it is just as just sell um, retain search to new clients I guess with existing clients you've got the challenge that they've got a preconception of how you're working and you really need to be um, firm about making that change or else it's much easier to go down the path of re least resistance and just continue to work with them on a contingent basis you've got to be determined to, to put the case forward and to, to want to work with them and to want to change the way that um, you're compensated for the work that you do um, so you have got those challenges with it with an existing client but whereas with a new client you haven't so simply explaining to a new client you know this this is who we are this is and it and it really helps and one of the things that we teach it's, it's obvious stuff but is to go to those clients with with and some kind of familiarity so um, direct competitors of the clients that you've already worked with and had success and had a track record with or those in a supply chain you know either um, they're a supplier to the client that you um, you've got a client your client in common yeah but they're in the same challenging location as the client that you've had you know really good success with or something that you've got um, a point of reference or a case study with uh, and if you're explaining, you know, this is who we, once you've diagnosed the need, understood their situation, and importantly, you've understood where they are from a talent acquisition perspective, how they normally go about it, what methods they use, how successful they are, do they enjoy doing it, how do they feel about embarking on this type of project, and got an understanding that we need there, and that importantly, there's room for improvement in the process. Um, and if there is, and there's an opportunity to recommend working to explain this is who we are and this is what we do and this is our, these are our credentials um, and simply, you know, the way that we work. Um, and sometimes we position it against um, alongside a contingent service and sometimes it's simply on a retained basis. Uh, this is how, you know, we operate. This is how we projects. It starts with a briefing session involving and just simply talking and they don't know any different. They don't know that that um, you know you have provided similar service on a contingent basis, and and actually their um, understanding is if they want to engage your experience and do all the things that you've done for their competitor, um, then they have to engage with you on a, on a retained basis, and it makes sense. Uh, but or we position it alongside a contingent service, like you know. Um, uh, you know, for easy to fill, everyday, straightforward hires, we provide that a standard contingent service. It's no win, no fee, no commitment on either side. Um, often um, in in conjunction with other suppliers, but for niche, critical, urgent, and senior positions, I retain search methodology, and that's our headhunting service. And this position, because it's critical, it's urgent, and you've got a specific skill set that you want to. Uh, find combined with a, 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 a set of behavioral competencies that you need to align with the culture i absolutely um want to apply a retained search methodology and work with you 
um, on a, uh, uh, using a robust and, um, a, and systematic headhunting process, importantly, and work with you until it's filled. Well, the, the other thing with all that, which is a wonderful response, is that um, we know that most hiring managers, they don't really particularly like recruitment. It's probably the thing that they're not good at, the thing that they don't enjoy, and it's a necessary evil to outsource that. So the easier and smoother you can make that process and more successful, you know, sell that, sell that to them. That It is going to be a, an easier way of doing recruitment as well for them. They're going to enjoy it more, and it's most importantly going to get the outcomes that they need. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's why I say at the moment, one of the um, easiest ways to transition clients are those that are asking it the most. Um, and really don't be afraid of asking those questions, you know, um, how do you feel about recruitment and how do you feel about doing it? And do you enjoy, enjoy it? Because a lot of clients really don't. They really, really don't. They don't enjoy the process. They've been let down loads of times. They don't like dealing with it. They don't even like a lot of them you know some of them will even tell you to your face um and it's just a perfect opportunity to say you know it just it doesn't have to be like this it really doesn't have to be like this and you know in some respects it, and sometimes i explain that it's easy to hate the recruiter but actually one of the main things is, is this contingent process that, that we're all constrained by and actually explain to that client um you know, do, do they realise what happens when um, we're working on a contingent basis? That we're we're constantly we're constantly having to prioritise because we're balancing the risk of working on those positions that are most likely to generate us a fee, and we're constantly having to judge whether it's worth spending time on this or not. And um, you know, our guiding system isn't always you know, and, and when when a client involves another agent and puts a competitor in the process it, it, get, it gets it goes even further down the list i think a lot of clients may be thinking that you know they're they're duplicating effort by putting you know two or three agencies on it and actually the reality is they're actually diluting the effort not only that agencies typically engaging with with the same people those people that will respond to linkedin messages and will respond to emails and with limited time to risk people are only able to you know engage with those you know that kind of tip of the iceberg and unfortunately they're the same people <laughs> so you know the client it doesn't realize but often they look a little bit like a, a house for sale with with loads of for sale signs outside inadvertently you know making it look like there's something wrong with them when when in reality and they just don't realize a lot of these things well i think the other thing with all this is that um you know if they if they want partnerships then partnerships shouldn't carry lots and lots of risk you know that's that's a, the whole point it's about building trust together and i think that's the thing i mean i never sold retained uh but i, I think it's just that level of trust as well to another level to a higher level as well and some of the clients that i work with that um, um just purely sell retain they're trusted advisors and and i've noticed as well they have more time to spend on marketing and personal branding and um managing their, their desk and their day as well and it's just kind of a no-brainer oh, yeah. but i i was uneducated to it so it's not that easy to say okay jumping in uh, next one what level of experience this is the question i'm really interested in so what level of experience should a recruiter have to work on retained search because i think a lot of recruiters automatically think you've got to have 10 15 years experience you've got to be the mac daddy of your field please educate us no, no, no. I guess, um, well, if you've, got the, if you've got the perception and you're setting out to become an executive search consultant, then yes, uh, you do need significant industry experience. And through executive search, a lot of the time, that's why those consultants are often industry professionals that have moved into search. So for executive search, yes, you do need to be top of your game know the market incredibly well and know what the hell you're talking about um for retained recruitment in general you, know, you definitely don't need loads and loads of experience and you don't need you know years in in the industry um lots of the recruiters that we help transition have got a year's experience wow um what yeah yeah 
uh, one of the girls going through the program at the moment it's just one of her first retainer and she's three months into recruitment um she's going to need support with the delivery she's she's working with a you know more experienced consultant that's going to make sure that she um and she needed help with to make sure it was a position that they definitely could they could fill but in order to be able to um to to, to recognize the opportunity identify the opportunity consult with the client to understand whether it is the right solution to recommend and then to recommend the solution you don't need years and years of experience lots and lots of the consultants that come through the program and that I've taught over the years have got between a year and well the opposite end of the spectrum which sometimes can be just as you know just as much of a shift you know with 20 25 years experience you know they've been working on a contingent basis forever um it's sometimes harder than those that that look at a retained model and go well that's a no-brainer you know why why wouldn't a client go for that and why wouldn't i want to work in that way um uh you know you don't you, you definitely don't need loads and loads of experience it helps to have a knowledge of what's feasible and what's possible and um, to be able to recognize the opportunity. And if you don't have experience of delivery, you definitely need support. And as a business, you need to support those that don't have that experience for your projects. So who, uh, what level of experience has the biggest thirst to want to work with you then? Is it the, the older ones who have got fatigued and want to try a different way? Or is it the new ones that are fresh and they buy into, you know, retain recruitment? without knowing too much about even contingent? I think it is the former. Um, most people that I've, have said they're fed up with contingent, that's our most common inquiry. And um, But inadvertently, because we work with teams, we tend to work with a cross-section. So yeah. we'll work with those that are you know, fat, uh, tired or fed up with um, being let down by clients and have seen, retain and want to do it. But get those because they just they come as a package and we work with them all um they don't even know what it is and, and until they said you know someone told them they're doing this program they didn't even know what retained search was a lot of them a lot of them are like well, hang on a minute what <laughs> i'm open-minded but i don't know what it is <laughs> so people get yeah we get we get all sorts um sorry do people get confused on. with retrained and retained then with your business <laughs> Um, I think sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes when we, we do the pitch coaching every now and then, someone will say retrain instead of retains, but um, it's it's not often the, yeah. Do you like it? Do you think it sounds okay? Yeah, it's yeah, catchy. Project. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you know, I, I've been hashtagging it when I've been promoting, so. Oh, you know, brilliant. Now, the, there's a young lady, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publicly speak about her, because I've been mentoring her for a number of months now, and she is wonderful. She's called Georgie Hart. She's just asked a question, Hi, which is just going to be our next topic as well. And that's about fees. You know, should your <laughs> fees be higher or lower when you're working retained compared with contingent? So, uh, Georgie, I'm answering your question now. Oh, well, sorry, Louise. Hi, Georgie. Hi, Georgie. Um, good question. Um, for me, there's no hard and fast rule. It is about what works for you and what works for the client. Um, there's a few tips. I mean, traditionally, you know, search carries a uh, traditional firms and the Shrek firms, as we call them, the Spencer Stewart's, Hydrix, and so on, um, will charge a third of overall comp total first year's compensation as a fee, and they'll break that down. A first third payable on commencement of assignment, the second third 30 days later, and the second third 30 days after that. Um, more agile commercial search firms smaller firms will follow a similar model which is a third um a 30 percent of uh, first year's annual salary sometimes base um and they'll split it but they'll put it on milestones so on commencement and read shortlist and on completion of the assignment the yep. big firms that are lucky enough not to even have to uh, do it on based on delivery and just charge regardless of what they've delivered or not um but more often than not when we are we're in the practice and we're we're being commercially um astute with our clients and recommending a retained in place of a contingent model um we're making it either fractionally more um expensive 
or um, higher value because it is a more robust methodology and they are getting your commitments to work with them until the position is filled. So it should and does carry and, and should carry a, a higher cost. Um, so it depends where you are at the moment with contingent. You know, if you're working at 20%, I'd position your retained solution at 25, for example. If you're working at 25, position it at 30 and make sure there's a differentiator um, in terms of the value. But, and I'll caveat that with, one of the easiest ways to win your first assignments and therefore show the client the benefit of work and that you're not just in it for the engagement fee and you're not just going to take the you know the, the deposit and run um, and that you can demonstrate a better, even better level of service on this is, is to say you know for the purposes of this first assignment although it does in higher cost for the purposes of this assignment to demonstrate my capability and the effect in this way I'd like to make it no more costly than the way that we work on a contingent basis and actually carry that first project out for the same cost to make it easy for them to buy and therefore easy for you to sell your first project. Um, and actually just to say that the only difference is the way the payment structure is broken down. Um, is it, is it um, then hard to raise your prices after that then? Well, no, because if what you're saying and when you're agreeing that, they okay, that's fine. Well, that's, that's fine. I'm really happy to carry this project out on this basis on the basis that future projects carry our standard fee and then at least you've got some room for maneuvering when you're writing it into the proposal and into the agreement for the this is sim purely for the purposes of this first project and once you've smashed it out of the park and shown them there is a better way because genuinely it's not a con you know it, it is it is miles better it's miles better for, everybody, for you which means you're easier to deal with your um like more time to deal with the client you're you're more assured you're more confident you're not constantly subservient or a supplier or um you know you're better to deal with the client gets a better experience it's it's cleaner it's more efficient it's easier for them to deal with it's not always um the candidate gets a better experience you know so it because they the client actually does see a significant difference in the partnership and i see it time and time and time again consultants coming to me and saying you don't know how how much this has changed you know my life not just me but my clients say that they just love working like this because often we'll win the first projects and almost you know two or three weeks later they'll give them another project to say this is just wonderful you know can we just can we just do this all the time it's like yeah that's fine but that we've got the fees now at a level that's sustainable for me and it works for both of us because if you remember you know we did that first project on a on the basis of showing you and so it was a long answer to your question yeah um, yeah no and i think this but, is, but, but it is possible i think what people struggle with and again I, I think even if i was back in recruitment now um the delivery side of things i mean the selling side yes you've got to discover you've got to consult then you've got to give this solution to the client but then you, if you've been selling them contingent, for example, then now you're um, going to deliver a retained service. What does that even look like? And how does that differentiate from, uh, differ from uh, contingent? Well, um, and it's one of the things that we start with, really, because it's important for you, know, you to know what you're entering into when you decide to work on a retained basis like you say it's actually the selling it actually becomes quite easy um it's not actually very difficult to um to sell once well. um, and it is the delivery that is much more difficult and lots of times to make that lots of people you know i'll back myself in terms of delivery you know i can i can find candidates like no one else and therefore assume that that isn't an issue um but the problem or you know there are pros and cons to everything and there are loads of pros to retained recruitment, but there, you know, there are some cons. And, and one of them is that once you've taken on a retained assignment, you have to deliver it. There's no going away if you get fed up or if the going gets tough or, you know, you don't get what, what you want from, um, you know, the first go at the market or, you know, candidate pulls out radical stage. You, you've got to stick with that and you've got to stick with the client until you reach it. Um, so you have to apply a method or a method and techniques that are going to ensure that you get a result. So what the reason I'm mentioning the specific delivery model is because it really depends what 
what you're delivering and what challenges you're um, up against in the market. The way that um, you know best practice search delivery is that you start with a briefing session, it involves stakeholders, you systematically cover in that briefing session every single component of that project that might cause a problem at any point in the process. So um, location, um, all the normal stuff, salary geographical parameters you know the, the actual job spec it's really important to define the competencies from you know technical and and behavioral to make everybody is aligned on what you're looking for but importantly um you you are able to accurately assess candidates in line with what that brief is and it isn't just a gut you know i think they're really good you can actually actually measure that candidate against the you know the, the criteria and be confident to say that this is a shortlistable candidate um that you're going to put in place a feedback process that means that you're not leaving yourself open to just not getting feedback because that your project's going to fall over if you don't if you don't get that particularly yeah. if it's um and that everybody is going to be part of that feedback process um and that everybody understands the timelines the pro the transparency the partnership what's going to happen in get specced in by a random agency part way through what happens with an internal referral what happens with a direct applicant and that you cover all of those eventualities and so it's very very clear what's going to happen over the next four weeks or six weeks and then you go away and do your research the important thing when you're carrying out a retained search for me is being systematic and thorough and it's the same with you know the, the big search firms it's um about key criteria systematic identifying candidates um, and then systematically approaching at every means possible looking to get as much engagement as possible but importantly sharing those workings with your client you know i liken it a bit to a, a maths exam if you um you know you get one point for the answer but nine points for the working out you know if, if, if in week three you're not getting what you want and you or, or a candidate's pulled out and you're back to the drawing board if you can't share what's with the client all they're going to say is um uh, that one or two CVs and you know your projects uh, is going to be incredibly difficult to to get back on track so be transparent and show them exactly where you've been and what you've been doing so uh, again uh, that, that would excite me all those things that you said but with uh, a recruiter with one year's experience when they first come into your training session are they a bit scared by that what you've just said now when you talk about the details of the delivery or not um it's not rocket science it is not rocket science. I mean, it is systematic and it is thorough, but it's not very difficult. You know, most of these, most of these, I was going to say kids, but I guess for me, because <laughs> I'm so old, um, they are. But um, <laughs> um, they, um, you know, they're, they're not stupid. They're, they're bright and they understand. You know, they 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 get it completely. And if they, if if you're giving them a a formula, a set of you know a framework to follow which is exactly you know exactly what we do and they're safe yeah all they've got to do is follow the process and you know they will reach a result and it's really that simple excellent okay um where do recruiters get retained wrong and i just want a short answer on this one because we've got some questions i want sorry to okay no, don't apologize just to let people know that i am the quintessential blonde idiot that i told louise it started at seven <laughs> o'clock this morning and it started at six o'clock and she realized that I've been a naughty boy. So, you know, I'm very, very proud it's of no it. Problem. I better do that. So you <laughs> It's no problem. No problem at all. It happens. It, it answer happens. The, answer um, the question. The, so the question for the me answer is, the question, where do recruiters get it wrong? Yeah. Um a short answer would be um thinking that it's difficult that would be what i would say i think a lot of recruiters don't do it because they think that it's going to be difficult or it's going to be it's something that they can't do or um you know it's for senior and confidential or it's just money up front or it isn't something that isn't going to be able to be part of um you know their lives and their careers and that is the biggest mistake people make it is it is it isn't difficult. It is possible. Okay. Um, I hope everyone's listening to that. Because yeah. I, you know, I'm sure there's probably some people who thought they couldn't do it or might not be able to do it, and that uh, should inspire them. Okay. It's 10 to 5, our time. 
we've got a few questions. I encourage everybody that's uh, been listening, if you have more questions, please don't be shy. We'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, we did answer George's, but I think we've got a few more here. Let's have a little look. Um, Chris Davis. Hello, Chris Davis. Let's read this out. When pitching retained, are you finding different results dependent upon if it's the hiring manager or if it's HR talent acquisition team deal with negotiation and ultimately sign off? Yeah, it is a good question. And um, when in the sales process, I'd always recommend um, approaching and um, recommending it across the spectrum of functions from the line that you may or may not be dealing with to HR to talent acquisition and um, whatever else might might be involved because inadvertently and at some some stage they're probably going to be involved in the decision making process for yeah but, so if you've started to make inroads and develop a relationship and um, uh, build credibility uh, with them then it's going to help when we get to the stage where they're, they're the one that's signing the um, mandate or writing the check. Um, does it differ? It does differ, but I don't know whether I could genuinely say there's any consistency. Um, sometimes you've got HR on board saying, yeah, I get it. I, I can see the need to do this. It's going to be a much better solution. But the the hiring manager going, I just don't understand why we need to, you know, why we need to, to to do this. Why can't we just do it like we did, you know, last time, or well, they, they just get some CVs? Problems, they have different problems, the hiring manager and the uh, HR manager. Yeah, um, and sometimes it's the other way around. Of course, sometimes the hiring manager is going, oh yeah, brilliant, no brainer for me. You know, let's do it, and the, and and it's actually HR or talent saying, you know, no. Um, we still want to be able to, you know, bring direct applicants in because we've got an advert out or whatever. Um, so, it differ, but my advice will be to approach all, all of them. Don't avoid HR. That's my biggest piece of advice on that. Don't avoid HR. Don't avoid talent. Approach them. Explain where you are, who you are, what you do, why you want to support them, why you're the best place to support them and get them at the earliest possible opportunity as well as um, working on your line tax and um, working them through the process. Well yeah it's effective. And did he then ask about sign off and things like that? What was the other bit of the question? Uh, no that was it I think wasn't it? Just one oh okay. Um, who deals with the negotiation and ultimately sign off? Who does? I mean, it depends on the size of the company. Sometimes it's just the MD or the CEO, isn't it? If it's a really small yeah. business um, and there isn't any HR or talent. Um, if there is a HR, more often than not, they will be involved. Um, they don't necessarily have a say, though. Sometimes they do, but they don't necessarily do have the, have the final say. Often it's line that actually has the final say, but they'll take input from HR. Um, but you just, you need everybody. Oh, sometimes you've got to pitch more than once. In fact, the, uh, one of the projects that um, one of the guys in Africa has just, um, just won, which is again a really nice one, two VP positions, 20k on commencement and 60k on completion, which is just phenomenal. Um, has he, it's taken him six weeks to get that over the line, maybe even longer, maybe eight weeks, you know, from the first initial identification of that opportunity, worked it through line, up the chain, because the contact that he had was quite um, and uh, all the time approaching HR and getting knocked back uh, even there was a talent acquisition team that had, had a go at, um, at these and, and started to well make a mess of it um, and eventually he's pitched about four or five times now um, and and finally had um, presented the proposal and had sign off yesterday wow. so wow 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 persistence a while. Okay, next yeah, question. This is, that's one of my mantras, David, professional persistence. <laughs> Good, I like it. Uh, I, I, I've got a feeling I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but I'm going to go for it. So we've got a nice <laughs> question from Yugal Bhatia. Um, what happens in the case if they fill the role by themselves and then ask for the refund of the deposit? Um, I wouldn't advise working on a reimbursable retainer if you can help it. 
So it's clear from the outset that the you know the engagement fee is non reimbursable. Yeah. Um, and that's the objective. Is, sorry, it is written into contract, and the objective of, of uh, uh, commissioning a, um, a, a consultant to carry out a survey that you want that person to you know do the work and to fill the position is not that you then go and make your own efforts to fill it directly. Yeah. Um, the point is that that is, that is the opposite, and if there are any direct applicants that they come into the process and are assessed along with any other candidates that you know that we're finding um, and that we take control of the process. And if if that isn't the case, then it it it, it wouldn't be right to take the search on um, because it's counterproductive. You know, any duplication of effort is yeah. You can yeah, hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we, lo we just lost you for a second. I don't know why. Sometimes somebody said that it was Zoom. Occasionally, it just does that, so I won't blame my headphones, which are new. Okay, thank you for that. Georgie Hart's trying to be uh, asking more questions. So, how do you factor in direct applicants and referrals? Uh, I've been pitching retain work, and the clients are reluctant to engage as they are also doing their own advertising and sourcing. But you kind of answered that a little bit then, didn't you? But I did. I think I did. Don't, you know, let them, if they want, if they want to go direct to market, let them go direct to market first. It is counterproductive to run, um, you know, two processes concurrently. Either we take on the search or we Okay, next question. And I think this is Fiona. And it's uh, Fiona with an F. I think I pronounced that correctly. So Fiona Lamb. You mentioned risks. Can you please go into detail the different types of risks when working on a contingent basis? So that we can educate the client. This is going to be a long list. Um, well, essentially, the risk is that you spend an awful lot of uh, time and effort. You put resources in. You're using your own time. You're um, talking to candidates in the market about an opportunity. So it's your you're risking your reputation of uh, of presenting that opportunity and having that opportunity to present. Um, you're, you're, you're putting your business at risk of um, spending their time and resources. If it's not your own business, it's, it's their, you know, the people that you're working for um, that is essentially all for nothing and, and actually not resulting in any financial gain whatsoever, which is, it's not really commercial to spend so much time and effort on projects where you've got absolutely no guarantee of actually making any return on it and i think it's as simple as that i think that's the explanation for the client well time is a precious commodity for everyone isn't it you know that's the thing okay yeah we've got a couple of things in chat so uh dale rollison said thank you uh really interesting and informative debbie mcdonald has asked a question i've always been very open with retained clients on the candidate info from an initial long list phase, I have provided detailed info on exactly who I'm talking to and what their feedback is, working mm -hmm. collaboratively with the client to refine the list as we go. What do you think about this approach and is it necessary to share this IP? Yeah, who was that that asked that question, David? It was Debbie McDonald. Debbie, nice to see you, Debbie. Um, yes, good question. As um, I agree with you, and um, I think it's absolutely imperative that you share. Not only is it um, demonstrating your uh, work and being transparent about where you've been and what, what, what you've been doing, but it's your tool to manage the project. By sharing that IP and sharing that information, um, you're educating the client on the size, the scope, the limits of the talent pool to enable enable them to make the right decision and to give you the tools to be able to manage that process and advise the client on um, making that hire from all of the information that they have available to them. Without that information, it's very, very difficult for you or the client to make the right decision. Excellent. We've got one last question. Uh, what level of position does retain best work? Is it C-suite level or middle management? Thank you, James Rennie. Um, James, um, good question. I would say um, don't try not to have a preconception.
is for senior positions, although it does work really well for senior positions. And in fact, when you look at the contingent process and the constraints that we work in, you know, that we've got to go, we've got to move so quickly. We don't have time to assess candidates. We haven't given the candidate the time to really consider the opportunity um, that we're, we're not, we can't put all the time that we, we necessarily need because we're, we're concerned about our risk and we don't want to put too much time into it. For all those reasons, clients with senior hires don't choose and those that are educated and, and know don't choose to work on a contingent basis. But it doesn't mean that that is the only um, application for it because quite often it's not particularly senior, but it is niche and it is specialist and it is a, a challenging to find or it's a, it's a specific mix of technical and behavioral competency or it's um or it's a really noisy market and there's just tons and tons of agencies and tons of just so much to get through it's very time consuming or it's just really urgent and it needs doing right or three or four of them where one is easy but two or three or four is much harder so those are the instances that i would urge you to consider recommending a retained solution not just um, mid and senior management positions. Yeah, I think it's got a stigma attached to it as well. And again, even at the end of that, people are still asking that question because they feel that it's, it should be positioned there, but it doesn't have to be the case. Okay, it's going light in sunny Cheshire. I can see it now. Uh, <laughs> and I really enjoyed this and I hope the people that have attended today have enjoyed it as well, more importantly. Um, where can they find you if they want to? Even, you know, yeah, yeah. you're a very giving person, but uh, where can they learn more from you? So um, we do all sorts of stuff. We do free webinars every month. Um, I'm always putting content out on LinkedIn with tips and tricks. There's loads of videos still already on there. Um, so you can find me on LinkedIn. It's Louise Archer and um, we are Retrained Search. Um, or on our website, which is retrainsearch.com. I'd love to speak to you, anybody that wants to chew the fat or talk through um, how to implement a retained solution or wants to know anything more, um, there's a talk to us option. Just let's have a chat. Excellent. Thank you so much. Louise, yeah, you're wonderful. Really nice to have you to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, David. Amazing for getting up at six o'clock, not seven. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's a pleasure you, to everyone. be here. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, 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 bye.